and Babush to continue in the uh, spirit of this session with um, how to actually use a quantum computer to solve some of the problems that we just heard about. Thank you, James, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this conference, as well as thank you to Nathan and Martin, who sort of teed up my talk very nicely for me today. Uh, so the goal is to sort of give an overview of this topic of, of simulating chemistry with quantum computers, which is sort of an expansive thing at this point, so I'll do my best. But um, let's start with this. So as you know, the world is made of atoms, and chemistry sort of emerges from the interactions of electrons in those atoms. And so I, I sort of believe that simulating systems of interacting electrons on quantum computers is kind of a, an ideal application. And that's because, at least in some circumstances, for instance, in transition metals, places with strong correlation, uh, these problems are very challenging classically, uh, yet they're extremely important. There's lots of interesting applications. Uh, so to give some sense, and you know, maybe this isn't with uh, uh, Martin's you know, state-of-the-art methods necessarily, but using methods where you can sort of carefully control the air, you know, it might take you seconds on a laptop to solve exactly for the wave function of methane, uh, ethane maybe minutes, and again using something like exact diagonalization, uh, maybe days for something like propane. And there's certainly a lot of ground between propane and something like an atomistic description of a superconductor. And you know, certainly we'd be interested in, in cases in between those two extremes. So I think the prospect of more efficient solutions in this area is very exciting, uh, both scientifically so, and it's also valuable. So you know, an application that comes to mind for a lot of people when you talk about chemistry is pharmaceuticals, and there probably are some applications there, maybe in developing catalysts for better um, you know, synthesis or something like this. Uh, but other areas like catalysts for industrial processes like fertilizer production, or for looking at, say, metal cathodes and batteries, uh, or perhaps better OLEDs for you know, this phone that Google produces or something like this. Uh, these would all be interesting applications uh, for this sort of thing. Uh, so as Martin introduced very well, uh, we're going to be speaking about the molecular electronic structure problem mostly today. So we have electrons and protons, and they interact via the Coulomb interaction. They have real kinetic energy. But we're going to be clamping those nuclei under the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So as Martin uh, talked about sort of in depth, uh, the concept of an energy surface is well defined. And chemists are you know, quite interested in these energy surfaces because they allow us to understand reactions and uh, also predict mechanisms of chemical uh, processes. And in particular, we're often looking for very high accuracy in differences in energies on these surfaces because those differences in energies um, give us chemical rates. And in fact, they're exponentially sensitive, such that at room temperature, we're looking for some fixed add of air of something like 1 kcal per mole in the total energy. Um, and so in, in some cases, maybe often is the wrong word, but in some cases, uh, this is certainly classically intractable, and that's especially true for systems with strong correlation. I should also mention, I won't really have time to get into this, but we should really also be thinking about using quantum computers as sort of an active space or impurity solver just for the most strongly correlated parts of the problem. In most cases, you'll be treating lots of the environment with lower levels of theory, uh, things like DFT, things like this. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk a bit about how we actually put this problem on a quantum computer. So we are putting a wave function on a computer, so we're going to have to discretize space to some extent. We're going to have to confine, confine these electrons to a basis. Uh, so a, a common basis that's used in classical electronic structure is molecular orbitals. So these are single particle solutions uh, from the sort of mean field solution to the electronic structure problem. Um, if we have, let's say, eta electrons confined to n locations, n basis functions like this, there's, of course, n choose eta configurations. So the wave function may span a combinatorially many uh, configurations. And so in the most uh, straightforward encoding that is actually what we typically think about in practice in quantum computing, um, we're just going to have one qubit for each orbital, basically. And the qubit is 1 if there's an electron there, and it's 0 if there's not. So you know this configuration would mean that there's no electrons in these two, but there's an electron here and an electron here. Um, and so this you know, method of kind of labeling what space is occupied instead of saying uh, which electrons are where is, co is consistent with uh, the sort of second quantized representation of electronic structure. 
Um, and there's different ways that one can obtain the actual discretization of the Hamiltonian, but perhaps the most common in electronic structure is what's called a Galerkin discretization, where you take integrals over these basis functions, which define a Hamiltonian that looks something like this, where these things are fermionic raising and lowering operators. So for instance, A dagger P A Q, that's an operator that transitions uh, an excitation from site from orbital Q to orbital P. And this is, you know, with, of course, it's in a finite basis, but up to the finite basis and, you know, up to relativistic effects, this is the exact um, many body Hamiltonian. Uh, so I should point out that these operators, they are fermionic operators. They act on fermions, not qubits. Qubits are uh, distinguishable particles of no special symmetry. Fermions are anti-symmetric and indistinguishable. And so, for instance, in second quantization, our operators have to meet certain anti-commutation relations that I've written here, uh, which means that if you wish to write down a Hamiltonian that acts on qubits, you need to find some, um, you know, sort of isomorphism that matches this algebra. You need to find some qubit operators that have these commutation relations. There's a number of techniques for doing that. One of them is Jordan Wigner, which just, you know, provides a simple mapping to qubit operators that looks like this. All right, so now we have a qubit Hamiltonian. Um, but I actually want to point out for a moment that this Hamiltonian has a rather large number of terms um, from my perspective. It has end of the fourth terms in it, which as we'll talk about later, uh, that's sort of a large number of terms for quantum simulation algorithms. Um, so I want to spend a moment talking about ways that you could uh, represent this Hamiltonian using fewer terms. Uh, in particular, uh, just this one slide, I'll devote to talking about this paper, which was a recent PRX we had, where we basically found basis sets that allowed us to write the Hamiltonian um, in a form that looked like this, which had only n squared terms, and discussed some associated quantum algorithms. But basically, the particular basis sets that we looked at, they looked something like this. They were some sort of a smooth approximation to a grid that actually came from a unitary rotation of plane waves, which is worth speaking about as well, because plane waves are periodic. So this is sort of a natural basis to look at periodic systems, like crystals or graphene, which is periodic in 2D, polymers, which are periodic in 1D, things like that. Of course, you need more plane waves than, um, say, Gaussian atomic orbitals uh, to model single molecules. And that factor might be large. It might be you know, a factor of 20 or 40 or something, depending on you know, how you're using things like pseudo-potentials. But it's not an asymptotic factor for those computer scientists in the room wondering. I should also point out, though, that there are a lot of people, um, for instance, Lin Lin here uh, at Berkeley or Steve White at UCI, who have been doing a lot of recent work on developing basis functions that have, um, that are more compact, or maybe not more compact, but um, have higher resolution, and yet also give you a form that looks like this with fewer terms. So you might want to check that out. Um, but with Hamiltonian like this, after you map it to qubits, it's uh, very structured. It has n squared terms, but there's also a lot of structure in it. So for instance, we had this uh, recent PRL showing that you could simulate trar steps of this Hamiltonian uh, in linear depth, even on a uh, linearly connected array. Um, so what is n? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. n is the number of basis functions, um, or equivalently the number of qubits, because we have one qubit for each spin orbital in this case. Um, all right, so the rest of this talk is going to be uh, sort of about algorithms. We've talked about representations. Um, and I'm going to talk about both algorithms um, sort of for fault-tolerant devices and ones applicable for the near term. So um, first, I'll talk about what I would kind of call the canonical quantum algorithm for chemistry. So the key to this approach is to sort of leverage the fact that classical methods, say mean field methods or other methods Martin talked about, allow us to prepare initial states that have some reasonable overlap on the ground states of interest. So for instance, if we're interested in preparing and measuring the energy of, say, eigenstate k, we should be able to start the simulation in some state psi that has some reasonable overlap on the ground state. And I'll talk, I'll justify that a bit in, on the next slide here. Um, if we can do that, the next step is to essentially construct some quantum circuit which encodes in its eigenvalues the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So for instance, uh, one such encoding would be the time evolution operator. You can use various methods we'll discuss to synthesize the time evolution operator, which would encode the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Another common one, which we'll also talk about, would be, say, a quantum walk that looks something like this. Um, 
So if you think about applying a circuit, well, let's just take the time evolution one as an example, to this initial state psi, then you know, quantum mechanics 101 here, you can just sort of um, expand what's going on in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, and you can see that what's happening is that you know, your, the output state is a superposition of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that are picking up some phase that uh, depends on which eigenstate it is. Um, and so, be, and in fact, in this case, that phase will directly encode the energy of the system that you're interested in. Uh, and so because of that property, you can use the quantum phase estimation algorithm to measure that phase. And in fact, you can use it in a projective fashion so that when you measure the phase, it projects you also to an eigenstate of the operator. Uh, and in particular, you're going to be project, you're going to measure you know, the phase associated with eigenstate K with the probability that goes with the squared overlap of the initial state and eigenstate K. Um, and in general, for phase estimation, you're going to require one over epsilon coherent repetitions of this unitary uh, if you're interested in measuring that out to um, you know, precision epsilon. And you know, epsilon will be a small number for chemistry because we want high accuracy. So one over epsilon isn't a small number of repetitions, which is why I believe that you'll really need a quantum error correction for this sort of algorithm. Um, okay, so I, I have one slide now about just the first step, about preparing initial states. Um, so I have, I'm going to show a little bit of data, which is from a paper by um, a number of folks here at Berkeley, including uh, Norm Tubman and actually Martin, who, who just spoke. Um, this will be out kind of soon, but basically we used a method um, which is called ASCI, which we believe converges, it's a classical method which converges the support of the wave function on the first few determinants much faster than the total energy. So it provides a nice mechanism, we think, for looking at, say, what is the support of these initial states on the ground state. And so this is a number of, this is kind of a, you know, some canonical data set of rather small molecules, many organics. Frankly, these are mostly things DFT would probably do fairly well on. Uh, but we see that it, they are in fairly large basis sets, so over 100 qubits in some instances. And we see that we actually have, in most cases, over 80% overlap, which is way more than we need. I mean, we would be fine with 0.1 or 0.01 overlap or something like this. So we're doing quite well here. Um, and I, I might also point out, for those who know what this is, you could also use these um, estimates of the overlap for amplitude amplification. Um, but I should point out that you know, some molecules, once they have strong correlation, maybe at stretched configurations, they're not going to have as good of support. So we looked at some of those instances, for instance, the nitrogen and chromium dimer, which had pretty good support at equilibrium, but when they were stre stretched, um, it turns out you actually have very low support on just one configuration. But were you to create your initial state as a superposition of just the first few important configurations, then you very quickly recover uh, overlap on the wave function. And what's nice is you can prepare a super, uh, arbitrary superposition of L states with uh, T gate complexity O of L. That's kind of straightforward to work out. Um, and so we're talking about 60 determinants or something here. This is an additive cost to phase estimation. So you know, we believe that we can do this. And it's essentially free because phase estimation is much more expensive. Um, OK, so now let's move on to the next part, which is about how we actually encode the spectra in these circuits. And first, I'll talk about doing that with Trotter. So of course, time evolution based on Trotterization, Nathan spoke about, should be kind of familiar to a number of you. You have a Hamiltonian that you can write as a sum of local Hamiltonians like this. And Trotterization in its simplest form, the first order formula would be you just you know, simulate these terms one after another and sort of repeat that for a number of steps. Now, Trotterization has scaling that is polynomial in the inverse precision, and obviously also polynomial in the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, because you need to sort of simulate them one at a time. A question, though, is how many Trotter steps do you need? And you know, there's been a number of work on this, specifically in the context of chemistry, which have shown a fairly poor scaling in terms of analytical bounds. Um, that, that suggests this would be a very bad idea. But then we actually do simulations empirically and find that um, we have much less Trotter error than you might think. But also, we have this issue with the simulations being very instance specific. It can be kind of hard to get broad trends here. So just to show some very actually ancient numerics at this point, here are some kind of small molecules. And I'm plotting the worst Trotter error that could be induced on any um, state for that molecule. It's a function of the number of spin orbitals. You get some weird trend. Well, you know, it turns out things like chemical properties often do matter in determining things like Trotter errors. Here's a plot of the same data against the maximum nuclear charge, which is not the thing a computer scientist would normally think of as N. And oh, look, now it's a line. Um, but this is the worst error that could be induced on any state. But I don't want to simulate any state. I want to simulate the ground state. And when I look at the ground state, 
Now I get some mess that looks like this. I don't really see a very clear trend. I do see that the error is much less than what these bounds on the norm would have uh, suggested to me. Um, so the conclusion is I, I think that trotterization may actually be very practical and very effective, but my expectation is that on the first fault tolerant devices, people are going to use it in what a computer scientist might consider a sort of unsafe heuristic mode. I think people are going to kind of guess how many trotter steps are required, maybe make some little arguments to try and convince you that it is, you know, the trotter errors converge, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, and we'll learn things and sometimes it'll be appropriate and sometimes not. Um, but um, you know, if, if you're upset by that, then you'll really be a fan of these sort of post-trotter methods, which are certainly more precise, in my, in my opinion, more interesting. Uh, and they are often faster for chemistry. So for instance, Nathan spoke about these linear combination of unitary methods uh, for, and also you know, instantiations of that using qubitization, which can scale sublinearly in both the number of Hamiltonian terms and in one over epsilon. And so in this method, we choose to write the Hamiltonian as a linear combination of unitaries, which is straightforward to do, of course, because um, you know, the second quantized Hamiltonian map to qubits is already in this form. And then we need these two oracle circuits. We need two circuits that do this, and you know, the simulation people don't tell you how to realize them. That's up to you. You have to come up with an instantiation of these. But one of the circuits, uh, it acts on this register that indexes the number of terms in the Hamiltonian as well as on psi, and it selectively applies one of the terms in the Hamiltonian to psi controlled on L. The other one, it creates some state on this um, ancilla register here. It creates a state which is a superposition weighted by the coefficients of the terms in the Hamiltonian, and there's some normalization factor lambda there. And uh, you know, the sort of general result of, of qubitization essentially is that with one query to this circuit and two queries to this circuit, one can create a quantum walk which uh, realizes this operator essentially. Now if you were going to do phase estimation as we are, you can just stop at that point. Uh, you don't actually need to do signal processing to convert this into e to the iht because you could just phase estimate on that and then take the cosine of your answer and it works just as well. The real question is how do you implement U and G for chemistry? So we had a paper at a, um, with, at a paper with Dominic Berry a, you know, three years ago now where we, we did show it, you know, that one could implement U and G both with linear gate complexity, but I should um, warn you that our method of implementing G, the state preparation thing, was really just for fun. It was highly impractical because it involved computing the integrals, defining the Galerian discretization on the fly. Um, and so that was interesting, but it wasn't very practical at all. You, should, you know, asymptotics isn't the end of everything. But very recently, last month, uh, we had another paper which focused on these um, simpler representations of the Hamiltonian with n-squared terms, um, which allowed us to get a very practical linear gate complexity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, in general, with these methods, one is going to need to repeat the procedure a number of times, scaling as this normalization factor. Um, and I should also point out that some other very recent work that Nathan didn't really have time to talk about, but this signal processing work sort of provides a mechanism where one can kind of, a hand wavy way of saying it is it provides a way one can kind of lower what this lambda parameter is because you can think of the Hamiltonian as two components, T and V, and you sort of simulate in the frame of one or the other of them. And so instead of having to make lambda T plus lambda V queries, you can end up making a number of queries scaling like polynomially in only one of those things, but not both of them. And so that can be very effective for chemistry. Um, all right, so this, was, this talk was normally about realistic quantum computers. So, um, you know, it's important then to talk about what maybe a good cost model for these algorithms is. Um, so again, I said that these algorithms, I think you, you're going to need error correction for. And because of that, I think that t, um, counting T gates uh, is a pretty good cost model. So T gates tend to come from arbitrary rotations and also from Toffelis. And implementing a T gate within um, these, uh, say, most topological codes in two dimensions, such as the surface code, requires something like a T, t factory, a place where uh, magic states are distilled, which allows you to apply T gates. And so it's some horrible thing that looks like this, if you know what a topological you know, surface code diagram looks like. 
Um, and the first error corrected devices are probably only going to have one of these things because these things consume a lot of logical qubits, maybe 80 to 100 logical qubits, which might be as big as your whole system register. Because you're only going to have one of them, you're probably going to distill these T state, these magic states in series, which means that your whole algorithm is going to bottleneck waiting for these one these gates to be produced. In fact, um, these T gates will probably be 100 to 1,000 times um, slower than a Clifford gate. So you can, in most cases, for the, early, for the first generation of fault tolerant devices, just sort of think of Clifford gates as free and just worry about this. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to actually really talk much about this. I have this table where I've sort of tabulated how the T gates and various approaches to this problem have come down over time. Um, you know, recently we've made some progress getting down to um, n to the third and then n squared with signal processing. But I do want to warn you that asymptotic complexity can be misleading. In fact, um, the authors of this signal of this interaction uh, picture paper would agree, in fact, that the particular way they do this for chemistry will have some very high constant factors that, for instance, make it probably not competitive for the first error corrected devices with the algorithm above, above it. Um, so, Anyways, it's important to actually count T-gates for these algorithms. Unfortunately, very few papers have done this because it's very tedious to do. Um, so the first paper to do this was this Microsoft work. Uh, it was published in PNAS, which looked specifically at, um, oh, was it published in PNAS? It wasn't Paradox. What was it? It's VOCO. Oh, am I, is it FE2S2? I, no, 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 no. It's this iron, iron molybdenum uh, complex that. Yeah, OK, you just looked at, uh, all right. So. Okay, it was 108 qubit active space, right? Okay, so it wasn't that molecule, I apologize. But it was 108 qubit active space. Uh, they found that you needed roughly 10 to the 15 T gates to solve it, um, which is a lot of T gates. They used uh, the arbitrary basis representation, the Gaussian orbitals, with trotterization, uh, which had a sort of formal end of the eight scaling, but something more like an empirical end of the six scaling. Um, the only other paper to do this was this one that we had last month that used, um, you know, it didn't actually require a specific basis, but a basis that diagonalizes the Coulomb operators, such as plane waves, uh, as well as the cubitization techniques, our method at end of the three scaling. Uh, we also went a bit further than the Clifford plus T and compiled all the bottlenecks to surface code fault tolerant gates. So we actually made these braiding diagrams, uh, which was. Um, sort of an interesting experience. And we also use some automatic compilation tools to lay out the entire algorithm in the surface code. Um, now, I'm going to show some results from that, but I want to explain one thing quickly, which is that in these linear combination of unitary algorithms, unlike in the Trotter algorithms, the cost ends up being much less sensitive to the particular instance. You can kind of quantify the cost just in terms of how many basis functions. It doesn't really matter exactly what the instance is. So for instance, it, the cost only enters through this lambda parameter, which I'm showing. I don't know how well you can see that, but for a couple different materials here, diamond, graphene, lithium, and it's all pretty similar. Uh, but anyways, th these were some of the results that we found. So here we're saying how big the instance is. Um, here how many T gates. You can see it, you know, over 128 qubits, we have only 200 million T gates, which is about 5 million times less than that. Um, and so error rates of 10 to the minus 3, which is what we've been able to achieve in hardware um, on devices so far, uh, you'd need about uh, 2 million physical qubits to do that. But that's, those layouts are based on what we could compile with existing software tools. My collaborator, Austin Fowler, was very um, much a stickler about this. We actually believe we can reduce the physical qubits by a factor of at least 10 just by doing better compilation between the Clifford plus T layer and the surface code fault tolerant gate layer. And that would be by using techniques like lattice surgery or for instance reducing the number of physical qubits used to encode a logical qubit when the logical qubit isn't being acted on. Um, but we haven't implemented those things in software yet, so Austin wouldn't let me put that in the paper. Um, so anyways, we have run times measured in hours, so you know, this is, getting less crazy than it used to be. We believe that we can use this approach to simulate, you know, whatever molecule, I guess it's not Fe2S2, but, you know, FAMOCO. Um, however, I should say that we need to sort of develop better basis functions for that, because we're not gonna use 128 you know, plane waves and get a good description of that. We, um, we're aware of this, but we are doing a lot of work now in basis functions that are compatible with these algorithms, but also give better representations. 
Um, so I'm going a little bit slow here. I'll, I'll speed it up a bit. But the second part of my talk, I was going to talk about um, these, this sort of variational approach to uh, solving problems in quantum chemistry. So this is based on the variational algorithm. And the idea is that you have some parameterized quantum state, um, which you sort of measure its energy, and you adjust those parameters to try to minimize the energy, basically. And this is a heuristic algorithm. It's a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. So the idea is you have some state preparation, a measurement step on the quantum computer, and then you have some variation variational optimization, which occurs on the classical computer. So again, the first step is you want to cleverly parameterize some short quantum circuit with you know, presumably a polynomial number of variables. And this is a very important step. Um, you need to think carefully about how you're parameterizing this if you want it to work. You know, then you apply this circuit to some guest state, maybe your best classical state, like you know, Hartree-Fox state or something better. And then you measure its energy. And then you use a classical optimizer to suggest new parameters. And this is sort of a closed feedback loop here. So this approach has been demonstrated in a number of experiments. In the first experiment, they got some, you know, this data is a little bit noisy maybe. This is on a photonics platform from the Bristol group. Uh, in 2015, we did both the VQE experiment, uh, which is in red dots, which did pretty well, and the phase estimation experiment, the one that I said needed error correction, um, which didn't do well because it needs error correction. Um, and we got chemical accuracy in the dissociation energy there, so that we thought was good. Um, here's another experiment that came from, the Ber um, from Siddiqui's group here at Berkeley. They looked at some excited states and some error mitigation stuff too. Here's some other curves on an ion trap. They used some different bases. Uh, IBM, they did this for molecular hydrogen. Their data looked kind of OK. And then they did it for lithium hydride. Their data looked kind of not OK. But then they sort of redeemed themselves recently. They put another paper out last month where they did some air mitigation techniques, and now their lithium hydride curve looks qualitatively OK. Um, so anyways, you know, we're going the still small molecules, but we're getting bigger here. Uh, so that's all good. Um, so I just wanted to, this is actually my last slide about the variational stuff. Um, so the big question is, from sort of an algorithm's perspective, how do you parameterize these things? What you shouldn't do is you shouldn't use a random quantum circuit, which is what a lot of people have been talking about. In fact, you can prove that random circuits, due to concentration of measure, uh, have a problem where you're going to see exponential scaling um, to be able to resolve any sort of gradient or do the minimization. Um, so you should, you should try to use some method that captures some structure in the problem. So one of the first proposals was a unitary couple cluster. So um, Mar Martin spoke a bit about couple cluster, and unitary couple cluster <coughs> is a sort of circuit which is a unitary equivalent of that. And in fact, it actually fixes some of the shortcomings of the traditional couple cluster. In particular, this is a strictly variational method, whereas classical couple cluster isn't, so you can't get divergent energies. And furthermore, it's a trivially multi-reference form of it, meaning it's very straightforward to just apply it to whatever superposition you want initially, and it works just as well. Um, so I think it's actually a very powerful approach and a very good idea. But the problem is for near-term devices, it's, it's quite costly. It looks like there's you know, end of the fourth gates or something like this and that. And that doesn't feel very near-term to me. Another approach which looks a bit more practical is um, what I would call trotterized adiabatic state preparation. And so here, the idea is you pretend you're going to you know, digitize adiabatic state preparation with trotter, but you say, I don't have the budget for that many gates, so I'm just going to take not enough trotter steps. And uh, that seems to work pretty well, uh, we've seen in, in numerics. And so I think that's kind of a promising approach. It has you know, a lot of the structure of the Hamiltonian cooked into it. You have a good strategy for initial guesses and so forth. Um, so it's sort of based on real-time evolution. It's similar in this sense, in, in principle, to the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Um, and maybe a kind of trivial statement is it works well if your adiabatic path that you're digitizing is gapped. Um, so for instance, if you can start in some initial state that's in the same phase as the final state, and you can sort of interpolate through a reasonable path. Um, so that was all I really think I had time to say about that. Um, I think a good cost model for variational algorithms, um, because this is intrinsically a near-term sort of thing, is to think about circuit depth. And you know, because it's a little bit arbitrary to choose a particular two-qubit gate, like a CZ or a CNOT gate, maybe thinking about it in terms of uh, arbitrary two-qubit gates, which also makes sense because you know, we're also, in our group, thinking a lot about uh, tuning up gates um, sort of at the level of microwave pulses. And we think we can essentially realize arbitrary two-qubit gates. So if you can merge um, single-qubit gates into your two-qubit gates, then why wouldn't you do this? 
Um, so I've listed here how the depths of sort of structured variational onsets that people care about has sort of improved throughout the years. And I'll note that, um, as I mentioned, the sort of um, uh, these uh, um, n squared Hamiltonian representations admit a n depth char step on, even on a linear array of qubits, which is something that I think is pretty exciting. Uh, I had a like, conclusion slide, but I knew I was going to go over time, so I got rid of it. Um, so this is actually my last slide, which is just sort of this promotion for what I call an electronic structure package for quantum computers. Uh, you should check it out if you're interested in this sort of thing. It's a tool for, it's all open source. It's a tool for obtaining these Hamiltonians and mapping them to qubits and compiling them to circuits. And it works with a number of electronic structure packages. We'd love to have it work with a QChem, currently works with PySCF and Sci4. But, um, you know, it, we have a lot of collaborators here. It's growing, so you should think about contributing. Um, so that, that was it, actually. How often do you think uh, you're going to cook up a library to keep it good? Is it for algorithm or? That's something you should ask John Martinez tomorrow, but um, I mean, it's obviously something that we would we'd need to compile ahead of time. Uh, it turns out that for for instance, for the particular um, quantum chemistry simulations, um, we have uh, if you look at this paper, there's actually a very particular two qubit gate that we would need to do the simulation. So we'd only really need to tune up one gate, but it's not a gate that has a name like a C naught gate or something. So how do you think that this would depend with connectivity? The, if you choose a oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, the connectivity matters on near-term devices. When I say arbitrary, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean forget about connectivity. I think that you should absolutely, if you're working in the near term, my opinion is you need to develop algorithms from the beginning that are aware of the topology of your chip, or it's just not going to work. Uh, you, I don't think that you're going to be able to develop an algorithm on an arbitrary device and then compile it to your restricted connectivity thing. There will be too much overhead. So I think the way to go is sort of what's done in this paper, for instance, where we think from the beginning, OK, we have a restricted connectivity. How do we design an algorithm around that? Um, it's good to see that you get away with like n square terms for the interaction term in the quantum chemistry problem by choosing the right um, orbitals instead of beating above uh, and what the above four. But is it obvious that you're not beaten up by the prefactors when you compare to like localized orbitals? Or well, this depends. This depends. Like, uh, yeah. This depends a lot on the on the system you're simulating, and it also depends on the the uh, particular basis that you're using. So, for instance, um, I can tell you know. This is maybe an esoteric example, but for instance, the uniform electron gas, which is a system people are interested in, the natural orbitals for that are plane waves, are this basis, so it's better than Gaussians. Um, so for instance, Steve White, who we're working with now, has been developing these basis sets that he calls Gausslets. They're wavelet transforms of Gaussians. And he's been able to show that the Gausslets have, he's only looked so far on hydrogen rings and hydrogen chains. But that's sort of a real chemical system that has the feel of, of chemistry. And for those systems, he has almost the same resolution of Gaussian orbitals, meaning the factor is, is substantially less than two. Um, between the two basis sets to get comparable accuracy. So in that sense, we think this is very encouraging. And then also, Lin Lin um, is, is here too, is working on some related uh, methods that he calls dis, um, discontinuous Galerican methods, which um, also you know, give similar forms to this Hamiltonian, but uh, with much higher resolution than, say, plane waves. And also, for periodic systems, you often want plane waves. And we shouldn't pretend periodic systems aren't important. I mean, there's a lot of important problems in, in materials. So um, you know, for single molecules, there's certainly quite an overhead. I don't think, plane, I don't think on any near-term device especially, anyone's going to use plane waves and come out ahead of Gaussians. Um, but I'll also point out, and I didn't want to talk too much about this because I don't like people scooping me, but we're working a lot on algorithms in first quantization to do with an error correction right now. And in first quantization, um, the number of basis functions you get is exponential in the number of qubits. So if I have 20 qubits, I have a million plane waves. A million plane waves is starting to look pretty good. Thanks. Just, just to clarify this question of choice of um, basis functions, this is uh, it's like it's, it's heuristic, or do you, um, once you make a choice, do you 
have provable bounds on the error scale? Okay, so the, as far as the, the basis set scaling, the basis set discretization error is fundamentally limited by so the reason Gaussians are better, or well, um, they have lower constant factors, is because they can resolve the um, cusp in the wave function at the nuclei very well. So the wave function has a cusp of the nuclei because, you know, electron. Right. Well, but uh, so I'm about to get to the asymptotic part here. So the constant factor comes from their ability to resolve this cusp of the nuclei. But it turns out that there's ways with both plane waves and Gaussians of suppressing the nuclear cusp very well. You can use pseudo potentials or you can do other things that work very well. The Gaussians can get steeper and steeper. The thing that actually limits the asymptotic convergence, though, is the electron-electron cusp. So the electron-electron cusp occurs at all points in space. Um, so it's actually very diffuse. And asymptotically, no single particle basis function has an asymptotic advantage in resolving that. They're all sort of similarly inadequate and can at best get algebraic convergence, like 1 over n. So. Um, so the, the rate at which you suppress air due to the electron-electron cusp is asymptotically 1 over n for either plane waves or for Gaussians. So asymptotically, the basis set air converges the same. It's a constant factor difference. Not necessarily, a, you know, it could be a factor of 50 or, or something, especially for small molecules. I am not really a fan of plane waves. I'm a fan of these diagonal Coulomb operators. How does the result depend on the way you do this Jordan Wigner? Because I understand there are many mm -hmm. ways. How do you know which is the best? Yeah, well, it depends on the algorithm that you're taking. So, for instance, there are some other transformations, like there's this Bravigatayev transformation, which gives log n local operators instead of n local. Um, so, say in the near term, for doing something like Trotter steps, we've actually found a way of doing the simulation which makes zero overhead from Jordan Wigner. So, we actually now have a scheme for doing this, these simulations in a way that the Jordan Wigner schemes or overhead doesn't enter at all. Um, if you're looking at something like cubitization, there's still a bit of overhead from Jordan Wigner, but I think that it's very advantageous to have a lot of structure in the operators, which is simple to unpack, and that's sort of necessary because to implement the operator that applies the unitaries in cubitization, you need to sort of do the transformation on the fly in a sense. And the logic's very simple for Jordan Wigner, which makes it I think preferable for those algorithms to Bravigatayev. But I will say one thing, which is in the near term, if you have a log n local operator, let's say you want to measure the energy, um, if you need to measure a log n local operator and you have a fixed measurement error, um, then you have exponentially less measurement error when measuring that operator than if you have an n local operator. So in the near term, I think that on the measurement side, there's advantages in using these reduced locality things. There's also some other techniques. James has some techniques that actually give you constant locality, and you know that's even sort of undefined better in terms of measurement error. So, um, in the classical optimization part of the parameters in VQE, like for UCC, say, um, have you done much exploration on how different classical optimizers, classical optimizers, like yeah. That's a great question. We're working a lot on that now, actually. Um, so we've done some studies. I can tell you a couple things. I can tell you gradient methods tend not to do very well because there is some sort of stochastic noise here. Um, so we've been looking mostly at things like surrogate methods that attempt to interpolate some um, model of the energy surface and descend upon that, and those seem to work pretty well. Yeah. Let's uh, take a break.